Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm excited to have Newman School head coach Jackson Johnson join us for this week's episode. Now, Jackson grew up in Florida, was a good baseball and basketball player. He played two years of baseball at Tulane and then transferred over to the basketball team and did two years as a D1 walk-on before being a grad assistant coach for Coach Mike Dunleavy Sr. From there, he was an assistant coach for John Carroll at Northfield Mount Hermon for two years, and now in Newman School's first year, he's the head coach there. In this conversation, we talk about the uniqueness of Newman School, as it is located in the Back Bay of Boston, one of the nicer neighborhoods there. We talk about them being in the NABL League, which is a power power conference in New England, as well as being up in NEPSEC AAA. So we talk about all the, the good things they're doing there, all the challenges they face, and I really think it's going to be a fun podcast for you to listen to by hearing from a brand new program and a, uh, a young coach. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. Maybe so you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh yeah, somebody wants me. Jackson, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, man. I'm uh, really, really excited. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on too. And uh, this was a unique year for you because um, this is your first year as a head coach. And it's at a NEPSAC AAA school. So tell me what the transition has been like for you going from an assistant coach to now the head coach. Yeah, I mean, as uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, it's like drinking from a fire hose. Um, but I've taken the approach that I'm the, the luckiest guy in the world that I get the opportunity to drink from the fire hose. And I'm just trying to trying to gulp as much water as I can, um, learn as much as I can uh, and and do right by my kids. Um, so it's been an absolute blast. What's been the biggest learning curve for you? Has it been the recruiting process, the placing in college, the game uh, time uh, decisions, the pregame prep? Yeah, all of it. Uh, it's really, you know, being an assistant, you know, under under John Carroll, who's, you know, arguably the best, best in the business. Uh, I was fortunate to see what the best looks like. Um but I didn't realize all the things uh, underneath the hood that the head coach deals with on a day to day basis. Um, you know, and it, it's stuff that I'm fortunate to do. Like I love having conversations with parents. Uh, you know, I love having the dialogue with, uh, you know, their AAU coaches, college coaches, everything. But it's um, understanding that it doesn't it, if you want to do it right and you want to do it for the kids, it doesn't really stop. So I'm, I'm really learning that um, and how to manage my time with all of that. Yeah, absolutely. And you're at the Newman School. It's the first year of having a big time basketball program there. Yep. Um, tell me how you ended up there. Yeah. So, man, I, I don't know how far back to go. Uh, I'll probably I'll go to college. So I played baseball and basketball at Tulane University. Um, much better baseball player, uh, but I love love hoops, and I uh, was fortunate enough to play hoops for Mike Dunleavy Senior. Um, who his name speaks for itself and learned a ton. And um, uh, through that, I I got connected with some guys at Under Armour, uh, specifically Matthew Penny, who, uh, you know, helped run the Under Armour circuit. Now he's working for uh, Brett Just. Um, and he was very, very good friends with John Carroll and was an assistant coach at Northfield uh, back in the late 2000s, uh, you know, like eight or nine, I believe. Um, and timing worked out. I was finishing up my graduate assistantship at, at, uh, Tulane and, uh, COVID hit and, uh, Spike Albrecht was the assistant at the time at Northfield, the, uh, you know, final four with Michigan It had that historic run and he was moving on. He was going to go to Louisville and, uh, coach there and, um, timing just worked out and Matt Penny, uh, got me to Northfield and that was the, the most incredible, uh, decision I've ever made. My two years at Northfield was uh, uh, out of a movie. Like it was transformational. Um, the amount that that I got to learn from uh, what that culture looked like, how how personally accountable JC was, uh, how he taught his players, transformational. Um, and then you know, as a lot of people in the prep school world know, uh, you know, Northfield decided to kind of 
make a little bit of a transition in in their prioritization of of uh, high level hoops, and uh, John decided to move on um, after the season. You know, right around this time, actually, last year, and he was such a huge uh, piece of why I was up there in that program. And so when he was moving on, I was moving on too. And I was considering going back into college. I had some options. And, uh, you know, at the end of May, he gives me a call and he's like, you have eight seconds to say yes to this. (laughs) And, uh, (laughs) um, you know, we had developed a bond over the years where I, I took me one second. I was like, I don't even need to know I'm in. Um, and there he presents the Newman school, um, which is this, I mean, you were down here. It's this incredible little space uh, in the city of Boston, the only boarding school uh, in the city. Um, we're in the nicest residential neighborhood in Boston. Um, the only thing is they hadn't had high level basketball, but they they had a head of school who's, uh, you know, played college soccer. He was the AD at Middlesex School, which is very pr- prominent uh, uh, prep school here and outside of Boston. And then he was the head of school at Kimball union for 16 years. Mm -hmm. So we had a head of school who understands what, you know, we did at Northfield, what I was able to be a part of could do. And he wanted to add that to Newman. And, um, you know, uh, he reached out to JC, they've had a long friendship and, uh, you know, he recommended me and the rest is history. Now, for those people that don't know John Carroll, um, Mm -hmm. you know, he's what's his role at Newman and and what's your role and how do you guys share or walk me through your all's relationship? Because I know a lot of people say, oh, John Carroll's at Newman, but educate people on what his part is. Yeah, he's uh, I mean, if you want to put like a a title on it, I'd say he's an advisor to the whole program, um, which means, you know, he's an advisor to me. Uh, as a young, uh, you know, aspiring servant leader, head coach, uh, we talk all the time. He gives me feedback on conversations, how to handle situations. I mean, he's fabulous, but he's also in the same capacity. He's an advisor to our players and uh, to our parents um, and really helping guide uh, in terms of all of their decisions, whether it's AU, uh, college placement. Um, He's just, uh, you know, he's a one of the best in the business. He placed 160 division one players in his time at Northfield. And those kids, uh, they not only were placed at schools, they, um, they went to the right schools. Like, I think it was some stat. It was like five or six of his players out of those 160 transferred as undergrads. Um, so our, his relationship with coaches and his understanding of what it looks like to play at this spot you know, you want to play at, at Harvard. Well, he has nine guys there. You know, you want to play at Stanford. He's got players there. He's got the best player on uh, Notre Dame right now. Uh, we multiple guys on Northwestern. So, like, he knows. And to have that person uh, with Newman um, is huge. I think the stat you just mentioned there, Jackson, where um, his players go to a place and they don't transfer, I think that's a huge yeah. stat. Oh, it's, it's monstrous. It was It was the one that, you know – when I was at Northfield, it was it was uh there were so many stats. There's so many. And oh, yeah. and different ones hit me at different times. But when I heard that one, I was like, wow. Like if I'm a parent, that's that's incredible, you know. So do you know there's uh, this is trivia I learned last year. I don't know if it's still true, but I would assume it was. Do you know the one D one program that's never had a transfer out in the head coach's tenure? Wow. Colgate. Yale. Yale. That we know of. Now Colgate could. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, good. Yale. That's Sorry. awesome. Fun trivia. Right I gotta there, tell which... my I gotta tell my buddy, my uh, uh guy in my wedding, Matt Elkin, is the oh. director of ops at Yale. So I gotta let him know that. <laughs> everybody knows Matt. I think Matt's the one that told me. So Dude, he's well, of course he did. Yeah, yeah. Everybody knows Matt, that's for sure. Everybody knows Matt. <laughs> yep. Um, so let me t- ask you this. So with my yep. clients, I always give them multiple options, right? And Newman's yep. obviously been one of those options for him. What's your pitch? Like, why should a player come to Newman uh, that's just established downtown versus maybe another prep school out there? Yeah, I mean, we're we're uh, I've been at both, you know, like I was I was at Northfield. I was at this big, you know, traditional campus uh, in the middle of nowhere. And then now I'm here in the back bay, uh, you know, point seven miles from Fenway Park. <laughs> um, and we're different. We're dynamic. Uh 
we, you know, we have four division one schools within a two mile radius of us. Mm -hmm. Like our first day of open run on September 9th this year as a first year program, uh, we had the head coach and assistant from Northeastern walk over to our open run. We had Harvard take a blue bike. You know, we had uh, BU, uh, Mike Quinn took the T. It's like two T stops. Um, And then, you know, BC is a couple miles away. They're the furthest, like. Coach Grant has to plan 20 minutes in advance to get to our open runs on time, you know? So um, having, having that access and ability to life, uh, I don't know. I could go on for a ton of reasons uh, why location is great. We're also, you know, we're three miles from the airport. um, So for out of town recruitment, it's just, we're taking the stickiness away from college coaches um, you know, anybody who's recruiting the NEPSAC, they're most likely flying into Boston. And uh, we're going to poach off of that recruitment, and we already did. Um, so that's a huge advantage in terms of exposure. Um, we really believe that the city is preparing our kids. Uh, you know, prep schools prepare them for college. We believe the city is also preparing them for life. Like our kids, they step on campus, they get blue bike passes, they get T passes, and they're able to explore. Now that puts a lot of pressure on us to recruit no knuckleheads. Like yeah. we only recruit great kids because they have that that you know freedom comes that responsibility. But man, like they're gonna leave here and and maybe they go to Penn. You know, we have Gus Larson, who's a sophomore at Penn, his brother's with our team. Like he's gonna be able to go to Philadelphia and he'll navigate their system in two days, you know, where it takes some of those freshmen, it takes them a couple months. Um so that's a that's a big advantage. Um, I think something that's not as exclusive to us, but is still pretty exclusive, is uh, who we play. Like it was really important for us. We wanted to go to the highest level right away. Uh, we are in AAA, and we're one of six teams in the NEBL, New England Basketball League, and that's uh, we're the only team uh, who's not in this tournament right now. Where I'm at, uh, it's Putnam Science, Brewster, South Kent. Uh, Cushing, Bradford Christian, and us. And we're a first year program uh, competing with all those teams. And we, you know, we beat Brewster this year. Um, but it was really important for us to play the best teams in the country because we want to attract the best kids in the country. Yeah. Real quick side note explain that new league to me, why it was formed and what makes it special. Yeah. So, you know, I think. I'm I'm still I'm younger to this. So uh, you know, I don't want to speak uh too much uh in naivety. Um, but from my understanding is all of these prep schools, it's about uh being the best space to prepare the kid for the next level. That's our sole goal. That's my goal. I think that's everybody's goal here. And um we believe that NEBL is is innovative in that where we had, uh, regardless of classification, we want our kids to get seen. And so we have the best teams converging uh, onto one site uh, on four separate weekends. So now instead of playing a one-off game where, you know, on a Saturday, I'm playing at Vermont Academy and I want to get coaches for that one game. Now we have the top six teams uh, coming to this year with South Kent, Cushing, uh, we had the one of Finkelstein's events, the hoop hall event was a, a showcase and they're all playing there. So now you have a hundred recruitable players. Uh, and so the bang for your buck for college coaches is just off the charts. And so that's why it was really important for us. And it's really important for us, uh, you know, to continue to expand it and, and make it the best it can be. Yeah. I love that outside the box thinking. I know that's what JC is, is so good at is thinking. Oh yeah. Thinking something no one else thinks and then actually implementing it. So um, and then you mentioned, you know, having that skill set of being able to navigate a city, you know, there's certain clients I don't send your way because I know the city right. would just be too much for them and they right. wouldn't be able to handle that where they might need to be in the middle of nowhere and just have no distractions. So totally. what, when you're talking to kids, maybe you're recruiting them, like, is there a way you can figure out if they could handle the city or not? Yeah. I mean, we're, we, a core value of our program is transparency. Uh, we, we do not shy away from those conversations at all. So I'm, right up front and I want to see their, read their body language, see how they react. But, you know, the, the thing that's cool about us is, uh, you know, we're kind of the only one that's in this 
space as a as a boarding school uh, where you can board um, in the best academic city in, in the country. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of the other prep schools, they're competing with each other. So if, you know, 30 percent of the kids can't handle the city, that's fine. Now we have 70 percent who can. The 30 yeah. percent can go battle with all the other prep schools. We're different. So, yeah, yeah but but I'm up front with it. I let them know exactly, you know, uh, the experience that my kids have had this first year, um, the things that, you know, what their life's going to look like, what we expect. And then I'm reading parent body language, child body language, and I ask them to be up front with me. That's it. Yeah, love it. Um, you talked about the best parts of being at Newman, you know, being close to colleges, having the blue, the blue bike pass, the T pass. What's the most challenging part of your location? Oh, that's good. Um, I think definitely teams coming in, uh, traffic wise is, is difficult. Uh, <laughs> we've, we've been late to some things. Uh, so I, I had to learn how to adjust, uh, travel. Um, I think, uh, let me see, let me see. um, potentially, uh, us getting to our venues, um, so that's, that's some things that schools have, have kind of highlighted about Newman. That's difficult. Uh, I don't, I don't see it that way. Um, but we do have to build in a little, a little travel time. Uh, our gym, um, gyms, we have multiple gyms are all within a mile radius of us. Um, so I, th I guess you could say that, but it, we haven't really seen many issues with that. Gotcha. Yeah. Now going back to you, you were a prolific scorer in high school in Florida. And you ended up choosing <laughs> to play basketball and baseball at Tulane. What were some of your yep. other uh, finalists for for colleges to play at? Yeah, so I was out of high school. I was just a baseball player. Uh, like that's where I was going going to college just for baseball. Um, and so I was between my dream school at the time was Virginia. Um, I don't know if you know how uh, baseball works. It's a it's a partially funded sport, so they have eleven point seven scholarships for twenty seven scholarship players um and virginia did, i wasn't good enough for them to give me a lot of money uh <laughs> so it was virginia tulane indiana ucf um because it was local um and uh clemson yeah and i went to i went and visited tulane and uh it was just the best combination of what i wanted um city but, academics but if you're going there for baseball yeah. how did you get wrapped up uh, and get on the basketball team. How'd that work out? Yeah. Yeah. It was wild. Well, so obviously, you know, I was a, I was a basketball player in, in high school and I considered for a little bit playing both at some smaller schools. Um, and, uh, my freshman year in high school, I tore my elbow. Uh, and then my freshman year, I tore my rotator cuff and I played the whole year with the torn rotator cuff. Um, and then I came back my sophomore year and had, uh, uh, a fracture in the back of my elbow that would have required surgery. And at that point I was like, okay, maybe uh, I'm not going to be doing this for the rest of my life professionally. Um, Cause that was my dream. You know, my grandfather pitched for the San Francisco giants. My great grandfather played for the Chicago white Sox. So that was like, yo, this, this is what you're doing. Then that happened. And I was like, you know, I find myself when I'm, when I'm down or whatever, I was going into the practice facility of, of two lane basketball. And that was my safe haven. Like I was getting shots up and that's what would clear my brain. I was like, I'm going to chase this thing. Uh, I'll transfer to division three. I'll transfer wherever I'm going to play basketball. Hmm. Um, and so my head baseball coach reached out, uh, um, to Mike Dunleavy and, and it worked out and I was able to walk onto the basketball team there. But the baseball coach was like, okay with you splitting time. No, I switched. I switched oh, straight up. Two so you, years. Weren't, you weren't playing yeah. both. Wow. No. So I played baseball first two years and then okay. basketball the next two, and then was a graduate assistant for the basketball team after I was done. All right. So that's in my next question I want to get to is you've got a lot of kids that potentially want to go D1 as a walk on, right? Yep. And you live that life. Tell me about your experience being a walk on at Tulane. Yeah, it was, it was um, aside from going to Northfield. Uh, and learning under that space, it was the second best experience I had um, because I went to college as a scholarship baseball player, started as a freshman. And so you have that uh, view of yourself um, and then you go and, and you you become a walk on um, and it takes uh, 
it takes incredible humility. Um, and I had to learn the humility. I didn't, I didn't have it initially. I'm grateful that I was willing to, to go through that and, and learn it. Um, because your role is to serve your, your teammates. Like that is your job. So it took me a, a few months to really, really buy in, but then, uh, I loved it. Uh, I decided to be the best that I could be at my job. I was going to know the scouting report better than anybody. Um, I was going to push them really hard in practice, but, and I was going to do it for them, not for me. Um, I was going to, you know, listen to my coaches. I was going to help in, in any way possible. Um, and that taught me, you know, a lot more for, for life than anything. So I'm, I'm super grateful for it, but it's not easy. There are a lot of people who it's not the right fit for, for sure. It takes a, you got to know what you're getting into. Yeah, when I see people like yourself that have scored more than a thousand points, you guys are terrible walk-ons. Normally, <laughs> normally because and I've had this yeah. experience in the past. Maybe it's not normal, but um, where kids like that that have scored so much in high school cannot sit the bench. It just is totally. not in their DNA, and that's why it takes a special kid to walk on. And yeah. you just have to know everything going in. Like, yeah, you might not get that TikTok video of you getting a scholarship from your head coach. You know, right? You might never right. touch the floor. You have to get good grades, and I just when kids are saying D1 or bust and they will you know, they'll walk on as an option. I just want to make sure they're educated on that because yeah, I think, I don't think they grasp the, grasp the full concept, but you know, having a coach like you can absolutely share what it was like. No doubt. Yeah. Cause I mean, I think it, it, it has incredible potential benefits uh, if that's the way you see it. But again, it goes back to transparency on the front end. Yeah, when you were a grad assistant for Coach Dunleavy at Tulane, what's one of the major mm -hmm. things you took away during that time? His attention to detail. Um, he really, uh, you know, in terms of win loss record, he he really struggled. He was an NBA guy, uh, you know, came to Tulane, and um, it just wasn't a great fit for him. But that doesn't take away uh, from who he was and uh, the level of intelligence and knowledge that he had for the game. Um, was was fantastic to watch. Uh, you know, he he started every morning on the on the treadmill and was watching film. You know, at six a.m., uh, he watched more film than anybody. And um, his attention to detail uh, and how much he valued that was um, that was cool for me to see as a as a twenty two year old. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. And you incorporate that now. I'm assuming at Newman. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Perfect. And J and John's the same. I mean, John's the same way. Um, so. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, let's go back to Newman for a second. Did you have two yeah. teams this year or just one? We just had one. Yep. Yeah. Right, and you were going uh, to two teams next year though, right? We're, we're still undecided. Um, we, we're going to see, I, my, my guess is we'll probably stay at one for at least one more year. Um, uh, I think just based on our, our current boarding population size, that makes sense. Um, you know, we don't want to have uh, too big of a percentage of the boarding population just being basketball kids at the moment. But the school, you know, is is innovative. It's creative. It's the same. They, they have the same principles as we do. Um, so um, we'll, we're open to things. So we'll see. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Keep me posted on that second team thing because I will. That's one thing. You know, a lot of programs now are doing that. And my right. biggest question always is, well, that's fine. I know you guys make a lot more revenue, but that's also placement. more placement, right? The bandwidth yeah, totally. it takes to place just one team of totally. guys, let alone two. And um, that to me is the hardest job of a prep school coach is getting kids to that next level, right? Totally. Yeah. And we had, you know, we had two teams at Northfield, uh, when I was there. Um, and so I know what that looks like and I know, uh, you know, I was actually listening a little bit to, to your podcast with, with coach chills. Mm -hmm. Um, and you guys touched on that as well. And, you know, it, I know what it takes, uh, to have two teams, the amount of investment you have to have, uh, in your guys, you know, you have to be advocating for them. Um, you have to know, uh, what they need to do and you need to be telling them early and often to get to where they want to get to. And then you have to continually update them. <laughs> and it's that communication piece on both sides with the, with the college coaches and with the player and with the family. And to me, it's all about bandwidth, right? Like you, you get coaches have totally. so much going on now. You got to make sure you have a staff in place that can help with that because you totally. know, a lot of the kids on that second team, they don't understand like, Hey, you're getting more playing time down here. Right. And sometimes they want to be on the main team. 
it's just mm-hmm. it's a lot so i uh, i any coach that can figure that out i respect them but i just know how, how much how much bad yeah so totally and that's why i'm fortunate you know to have to have john uh as an advisor um, oh yeah because you know we have somebody that experienced who can kind of streamline some of those things for us yeah for perfect sure. let me go back to this since you've been around so many good guards at northfield and at newman what in your opinion does it take to play d1 if you're a guard who how tall are you <laughs> well that might be part of it in your opinion yeah yeah that's a that's a huge piece um you know, like my point guard right now, Luca Luca Taves, uh, he's he's a six foot guard, um, and he wants to play high major. Um, he has eight ten offers right now, um, and he wants to see how good he can get. Uh, and to be a six foot guard and to do that, man, attention! Talk about attention to detail. Uh, talk about uh, production. You know, we we say that our point guards uh, three to one assist to turnover ratio is not acceptable. Uh, wow. Spike Albrecht, who played at, at Michigan and, and played at Northfield, he was seven to one. Um, and so that's that's what our, our guys have to be incredible decision makers. They have to be dictating tempo as a true point guard. It has to be them dictating pace of game all game long. And then you you got to you got to be able to make shots uh, as a six foot point guard. You got to be able to bring your defender out to increase usable space on the floor um, for sure. Yeah. So, but I, I would say, I would say, uh, uh, tempo and, uh, assist to turnover ratios. It has to be elite, elite for a shorter guard. Now, if you're six, four, you're a power guard, you're Rowan Brumbaugh that we had last year was at Texas. Uh, you get away with a little more, you know, yeah. Yeah, he's a big boy. So. Every inch you go up, you get a little bit more leeway, right? Totally. Totally. Jackson, we're going to finish up here on some quick hitters. All right. Yep. So let me know thoughts. What the best win of your career as a player. Oh man, as a player, um, could be Tulane or could be high school. Yeah, I know, I know. Well, two Tulane basketball, we, we we weren't uh fabulous. I would say Tulane Tulane baseball, um, beating Houston, um, that was that was a fantastic win, uh, and it solidified us uh getting into the NCAA tournament, um my freshman year uh, and i had i had some production in that win so i was a part of the winning so that was okay. a good one uh yeah. this is when i just thought of would you rather have front row at a red sox game or floor seats at a um celtics game celtics okay no um, question best win so far your first year as a head coach what was your biggest win this year brewster brewster at brewster yeah they were ranked number one in the country this year um that was that was a huge win for our program and my guys laid it out on the line. Mm. Things had to go right, but my guys gave – there was nothing left in them. They played their butt off, so I was really proud of them. Best player in basketball you ever played against, either in high school or college? Ooh, best player. Uh, best player I played with was uh, probably Caleb Daniels. He's uh was with us at Tulane. He's now uh, at Villanova. Uh, he's their second leading scorer at Villanova. Um, best player I played against, oh man, uh, probably somebody on the, those Cincinnati teams, uh, when Mick Cronin was there, um, they had some really, really good players. Um, uh, the Washington guy, uh, six ten kid who transferred from NC state to, uh, Cincinnati killed us. And now he's an assistant at Loyola Chicago, okay. Kyle Washington. Yeah. He was fabulous. Okay, how about uh, these past three years? Who's the best player you've coached against? Oh, uh, I think El Marco was probably mm-hmm. the best uh, this year. Um, Solo Ball was really, really good too. Um, and then we played against the the other one who's in that conversation uh, would be the guard from uh, NBA Academy Africa. We played against them. Uh, he just committed to GV Ignite, uh, Terry, uh, six seven point guard. Uh, he's he's fabulous. Right now, Marco is that on Marco Johnson? El Marco Jackson, yeah, South Jackson. Kent McDonald's All American, um, going to Kansas. Yeah. Uh, the game is just so effortless to him. Like even at the AAA NEBL level, uh, you know, he could get you. I talk about pace, like as a point guard, he was in control. Uh, the two times we played them, he was in control of what happened on either end of the floor. It felt like the whole game, um, and that was pretty cool to to watch. Yeah. Uh, favorite movie of all time? Uh, probably Hoosiers. Good call. 
That's in my that's top three I, as well. <laughs> Yeah, that's hey, what I that's what I grew up with. <laughs> you know you can go to that gym, right? I can go to the Hoosiers gym? Yeah, it's in Knightstown, Indiana, about 20 miles east of Indianapolis okay. off the interstate. And they host games there, too. So just think of they that. They still do. They still do. Have you been there? Have you oh, been yeah. there? Twice. Not for a game, but I've just walked in twice. And there's the door's always open pretty much. And there's always a basketball in there you wow. can shoot with. And Really? JC likes outside the box things. So why don't you guys figure out some like a game there against Lalamere next year? Yeah, let's do it. All right. All right. You heard it here first. I'll get it done. Don't worry about that. We'll go at the prep athletics <laughs> classic. How about that? I'm, I'm all in. <laughs> uh, what are your hobbies when you're not coaching or, you know, being attention to detail with your job? Yeah. Um, whew. For, for the, these first eight months. Uh, <laughs> so I got married on June 4th and, uh, recruited my whole team uh throughout the summer so these first eight months since june 4th uh not much uh <laughs> if i have any extra time i'm spending it with my wife um she was kind enough to let me move the honeymoon after our wedding uh because mm -hmm. i had to get newman right um but i do i i like to read uh and and definitely exercise so right um right now i, I play pickup with our guys uh every day and that's that is so relaxing for me um I don't like to run, but I like to lift too. Yeah. Uh, lift and read. So, you know, my, my <laughs> first visit to the New England prep schools, everyone said you got to do, go to Northfield Mount Hermon. And this must have been nine years ago. And uh -huh. uh, sure enough, John was out there playing with the team and wow. uh, the whole two hours. And I was mm -hmm. like, wow, this guy is. Uh, and I haven't seen that since at another prep school. So I'm sure that rubbed off on you a little bit. Oh, my God. The first day, <laughs> I got to tell this story if you have two minutes the first day I went up there my first year and we played uh open run uh he 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 brought the the team in at the end and uh told me that I was the I was the worst player out there <laughs> I wasn't competitive enough whatever all the things you know that they value um making bad decisions and I was like okay this is how it goes here at Northfield. And ever since then, uh, it's completely, it's been different. <laughs> <laughs> Second day, I don't think I lost a game. So oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. He still plays. He still plays with our Newman guys. At Good 52. for him. Good for him. Yeah. He shoots the crap out of it. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. He ought to. Yeah. He's such a prolific scorer back in the day. So. Yeah, no doubt. Is there anything you want to mention that we didn't uh, touch on this, uh, this talk? Um, that's a, that's a good question. Um, no, I, th I mean, I think I talked about, you know, who we are in terms of innovation, um, you know, being a, being a school in the city or competition, uh, we're playing and we're going to continue to play against the best teams we can. Um, you know, I, I think I just wrap it up with, uh, you know, who you're getting in, in me as a coach. Cause you know, I think something you stress on these podcasts is talking about, uh, the coach, like, yeah. The, the, the guys that you deal with, like they are making decisions outside of just basketball, but the coach is really important. And um, so who you're getting in, in me is somebody uh, I'm not going to be outworked. Um, I understand that that's how uh, I, I create and, and shrink the gap between the coaches that have more experience than me. And I'm going to, I'm going to model what I, I tell to my players. Um so this year, like that was some of my best coaching with my guys was showing them uh, when I messed up and I didn't do things perfectly. I held myself uh, personally accountable and I showed that I really tried to show that publicly um, and to show them that failure for us is, you know, that's the goal. Like I'm reading The Obstacle is the Way right now by Ryan Holiday. Mm -hmm. And like, that's the goal. We want to we want to put you in positions where you have to be resilient, where you have to struggle. And I, as a coach, want to hold myself to that standard just as high as or higher than I'm holding my players. Um, and that's who you're going to get, you know, with with me at the helm. Love it. Love it. I yeah. appreciate you sharing yeah. that. Where can people find you if they want to reach out to you, Jackson? Yeah, they uh, on on social media. Um, I got I got to get my handle. Uh, I might have to text it to you so you can. It'll, it'll be in the show notes, it. people that are okay. watching this. So don't worry about that. But Perfect. um, yeah, we'll yeah, put Instagram, that in Instagram, and Twitter. Twitter's probably the best one. You know, that's that's where I use that as an information platform. And then I'll put my my email as well. Um, and then do you do phone numbers? I mean, I'll give out my phone number too. Absolutely. Um, you can put it wherever I'm, you want. I'm on this. Yeah, I'm on this thing 24-7, so. <laughs> As am I. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine.
Well, Jackson, thanks so much for joining us today on the Prep Athletics Podcast. I really appreciate it. And um, if you guys like this conversation, uh, feel free to subscribe to YouTube. That's where all the content is, plus bonus footage. Um, sign up for the newsletter at prepathletics.com to be up to date on everything going on in the prep school world. I'm on all the socials as well. And uh, if you like the podcast, go ahead and subscribe so you never miss an episode. But Jackson Johnson, head coach of the Newman School, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Corey. Uh, really appreciate everything you do, and I, I'm looking forward to continuing to grow our friendship and relationship. Absolutely. It's mutual. Okay, thanks so much, guys. I'll talk to you next week. Take care. See ya.